Hello, I'm the ghost of chemical engineering past. My job today is to try and give you a little bit of insight into why the industry you see in your era is as it is. I'm here in Belgium, near the city of Liège in the Sereng, in the Cockerell Sambra steelworks, or what's left of them. In my era, these steelworks were the powerhouse of Belgium. This whole area was a massive industrial area. It was second only in size to the black country in England, which was the biggest industrial area in the world at that time. It's derelict today, but it's here for a very good reason. It was here because there are bountiful supplies of raw materials needed to make steel, ironstone, limestone, and coal. It's very important that you know why industry is based where it is. What were the factors that caused an industry to be built? And in many cases, it's the availability of raw materials. What I would like to do in this lecture is to give you an idea of what raw materials are used in the chemical industry and the food chain that exists between those raw materials and the finished consumer products that people go out to the shops and buy. On my blackboard, I'm going to put a pyramid. At the tip of this pyramid is meant to represent raw materials. It's a tip because, in reality, there are a very small number of raw materials relative to end products. The sort of raw materials we might be talking about might be coal. In my era, coal was the dominant raw material for pretty much everything. In your era, you use oil, you use natural gas, you use minerals, you use biomass, you use other grown products for foodstuffs. When we sum up the total number of raw materials, we're talking order 10. It might be 20, it might be 30, but it's a small number in general. Now, these raw materials in the chemical industry are turned into either what we term base chemicals, things such as ethylene or synthesis gas, or fuels such as liquefied petroleum gas or kerosene or motor gas. Synthesis gas, ethylene, Benzenes, toluenes, xylenes, these are all things we will be encountering later on. But from these base chemicals, intermediate chemicals are made. And there's actually quite a large number of intermediate chemicals, hundreds of different types of intermediate chemical. Things like acetic acid, things like urea, things like a pure terephthalic acid. All these things are not raw materials in their own right, they are derived from raw materials via base chemicals but they are also not in their own right a finished consumer product. It's very rare that you go and buy five tonnes of urea from the supermarket or 75 kilos of pure terephthalic acid. However, these intermediate chemicals are usually one of the final building blocks to a consumer product. Pure terephthalic acid, for example, would be turned into polyethylene terephthalate, a very commonly used polymer in bottles, in clothing. Urea would be combined with other things such as phosphate and nitrates and made into fertilizer. The thing that is striking is from a very small number of raw materials, a relatively small number of base chemicals, quite a small number of intermediate chemicals, many tens of thousands of different consumer products are manufactured. What I would like to do now is to give you an idea of how oil and gas gives rise to these base chemicals and to these consumer products. And really what we see is that there are four major processing routes. Of course, they're not the only processing routes, but there are four major processing routes that you commonly see from oil and gas derivatives. The first of these that I'm putting on my blackboard are benzene, toluene, and xylene. Aromatics, simple aromatics. These aromatic chemicals are very, very valuable because end products from these are things like polymers such as nylon, such as polyethylene terephthalate, polyester, such as polystyrene, an engineering thermoplastic. So we can trace from the beginnings of oil and gas through a food chain of intermediates through to the finished product. It might be a nylon stocking or a polyester shirt or the polystyrene casting for a piece of electronics. Alongside benzene, toluene and xylene we have ethylene, a very very simple molecule but an essential building block for the chemical industry. 
From ethylene, via a number of different intermediate chemicals, we'll end up with things like refrigerants, some anaesthetics, polyvinyl chloride, another polymer, polyethylene, a very commonly used and one of the first manufactured polymers, as well as a host of solvents, things such as dry cleaning fluids or paint solvents, all derived from oil and gas via ethylene. Alongside benzene, toluene and xylene and ethylene, we have groups of other linear hydrocarbons, butanes, butadienes and so on and so forth. Again, there's a whole processing route dedicated to these chemicals that will end up in end products such as alkyd resins, one of the things that you find in paints, methyl tertiary butyl ether, which is a petrol additive, and things like glycerin, which is a food additive. The last of the major processing routes will be methane and syngas. Syngas is short for synthesis gas. Synthesis gas is simply a mixture of carbon monoxide and hydrogen. In my era, we didn't use methane for synthesis gas, we used coal. It used to be called town's gas or producer gas. But from synthesis gas, there is again a whole industry that is built. End products of this industry include things like ammonia, ethanol and nitric acid, all things that you may be familiar with. One of the key messages that I wanted you to take home from what I've got on the blackboard is that even in your era, oil and gas are very important raw materials for the chemical industry. So we need to know a little bit about them. Crude oil is a mixture of thousands of thousands of different chemical species. If we break it down compositionally, we might see roughly it has a range of carbon content between 80 and 87 weight percent, 10 to 14 weight percent of hydrogen or thereabouts. There are some nitrogen containing species, somewhere between 0.2% and 3% by weight, some oxygen containing species from maybe one twentieth of a weight percent through to one and a half weight percent and also sulphur containing species. It's these sulphur containing species that often give most problems during oil processing because if we're making a fuel and it has sulphur in it therefore by burning the fuel we will have sulphur dioxide which is a powerful pollutant. When crude oil is classified you will hear people talking about sweet crude and sour crude and all this is with respect to the amount of sulphur that is in an oil. If there is less than one half of a weight percent of sulphur it is termed sweet. If there's more than half a weight percent it is termed sour. Sour because sulphur products are acidic and historically we associate sourness with an acidic nature. We'll also hear about oils being classified as light or heavy and this is a density classification and tells us where the molecular weight distribution is largely lying. If we have a density of less than roughly 860 kilos per cubic meter, you and your metric use it, it used to be pounds per cubic feet in my day, we have a light crude oil. For heavy crude oils, we're looking at oils with a density greater than about 860 kilos per cubic meter. From a molecular standpoint, we see all sorts of different molecular species. We can see cyclic, cyclic hydrocarbons such as cyclohexanes and cycloalkanes. We see aromatic species, your benzenes, your toluenes, your xylenes. We can have aromatics as both single aromatics and polyaromatics. Of course, you will find linear hydrocarbons, alkanes. You'll find branched hydrocarbons. Also, you will find sulphur containing species such as thiophenes. These are the species that give us problems in processing. And there is an example of anthracene, a polyaromatic species. So there are many, many different chemical species in oil and a batch of oil from one well will be chemically very different from a batch of oil from another well. So when we think of oil refining, something that we're going to be talking about in the next part of this lecture, we will see it has to be an incredibly adaptable process in order to produce very, very defined end products that the consumer wants from an immensely variable raw material. Alongside crude oil, of course, there are other raw materials. If we want atoms other than carbon or hydrogen, then we have to look sometimes to minerals. For example, you will see vast swathes of chemical industry built on ancient salt deposits. So rock salt, is a source of chlorine and a source of sodium. You will see volcanic deposits of sulphur 
and again in some places this sulphur will be mined and extracted and will give rise to things like sulfuric acid. You will see deposits of fluorite, fluorospar, it's very common in some areas of England, in the Peak District for example, and fluorospar will yield us fluorine atoms and so for species such as refrigerants we will have to use a source of fluorine. Quartz, silicates. Silica is very, very widely used as well. If you think of sealants, if you think of some non-mineral oils, if you think of the entire electronics industry based on silicon wafers, some, not something we used to see in my career, but is something that dominates your era, it all goes back to silicon-containing minerals, typically quartz. Of great relevance to where I am now is hematite and magnetite. Hematite is an iron oxide and when you find this in geological formation it's iron ore. In the area that I'm in, in the Sereng area, this was associated with sandstone and so we call this ironstone. In many parts of the world iron is volcanically deposited, such in northern Scandinavia, where you have very 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 rich iron containing ores up to 70 or 80 percent by weight compared to these sandstones here which may be only 20 to 30 percent by weight of iron. You may also see important minerals such as halite. There's large halite deposits within England, underneath the North Sea, and these contain potassium. Very, very valuable indeed. We may also see biological raw materials. If you look back through the history of the chemical industry, long before man-made polymers came into being, we used to use nature's polymers, cellulosics. And so if you think of um, cellulose nitrate, if you think of cellulose acetate, these are very common products from the early chemical industry. Cellulose acetate was used as yarns and as fibres and as materials. And of course wood is still today a very important source of the raw material for paper. Sugarcane is being grown in large parts of the tropical world. And sugarcane, or any other sugar containing plant, provides us a very good route for fermentation to ethanol, which is being used as a fuel substitute. Water mustn't be overlooked. If we think of how we turn methane to ammonia, we do so by converting methane into hydrogen first, which is something which we call steam reforming. We could not do this without water as a raw material. Also thinking about ammonia, we have hydrogen, we need nitrogen and we source that from air. So air by itself is also a very important raw material. What I would like to do is to summarise a few key points. My aim for this part of this lecture was to tell you a little bit about how raw materials transition into finished products and to give you a little bit of an idea of the food chain that exists in between them. We're going to look at this in a lot more detail in the forthcoming lectures but we have to start somewhere. We've identified some very important processing routes. We've identified the benzene toluene xylene route, we've identified the synthesis gas route, the ethylene route, and routes due to other linear hydrocarbons. We've also seen that alongside crude oil and natural gas and coal, we have minerals and biomass also as important raw materials for the chemical and process industries.